I'm James Kim, Cardia's lay leader, and it is my privilege to introduce our special guest preacher for today. Pastor Steve is preaching across town at Wilshire United Methodist Church, and he and his wife, Pastor Susanna, are exchanging pulpits this week. Many of you know Reverend Susanna Kim. She served here at Cardia for many years with Pastor Steve before being ordained as an elder and appointed to Wilshire United Methodist Church, where she is currently serving as the associate pastor leading the multicultural English ministry. She is a graduate of Fuller Seminary and the better half of our own Pastor Steve. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Susanna back to Cardia as our preacher this morning. Good morning, Card Cardia. It's good to be back. I'm going to raise this a little bit to my high heel level. How are you all this morning? <laughs> good. I think half of you said good. Well, it's, like I said, it's good to be back. Steve and I decided it's been three years since I've been gone. Um, and so it'd be a good opportunity for us to exchange pulpits and for uh, Wilshire to meet Steve and for me to be back and say hello and catch up with all of you. And it's good to see some old faces and some new faces, a blend of both. So I'm so glad to be back. Uh, today's scripture comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 to 10. And it reads, as you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe the stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, the word of God for the people of God. In our text, we, we see and we find a lot of references to masonry, and so I have a couple of jokes for you this morning. What did, why did the rock shower every morning? <laughs> he wanted to start with a clean slate. All right, I have one more. Why did the stone take English lessons? to help it talk bolder. <laughs> the, the pity response. <laughs> I appreciate that. Well, I'm a huge fan of home if improvement shows, and there's quite a few on Netflix and other networks. And one of my favorite is Fixer Upper. Uh, I don't know if you're a fan of that. I am. I love the fact that they take run-down homes and they turn it into dream homes. And it becomes astonishing. It's just, you know, fabulous what they can do. And Chip and Joanna Gaines, they're this husband-wife combo duo, and they do such a fabulous job. And I noticed that on Netflix, there's this show called Dream Home Makeover. And so it got me thinking, what does a dream church makeover look like? And it looks like our text for today. But before we get started with a dream church makeover, before you get started with a home makeover, you kind of have to go over the history of the existing home, right? The existing church. And so where are we? we let's look back in the history of God's presence. So we first find God's presence with his people uh, through the pillar of cloud, through the pillar of fire when the Israelites left Egypt. During their, their exodus journey, uh, God was with them, like I said, through this pillar. And God was with them at, in the tabernacle during the time of Moses. God descended upon uh, the tabernacle, and uh, that's how they knew that God was with them, and God spoke to Moses. After that, God uh, came and descended upon the temple. The temple was built by King Solomon, and um, that's where he dwelled. Unfortunately, the people of Israel sinned. They were rebellious. Uh, they worshiped other idols, and it caused them to be exiled from their land. 
And so when they were exiled and they returned back home, the glory of God, the presence of God never re-entered the temple of Solomon. And so it took about 400 years until God's presence came back. And this prophecy that we find in Malachi is this. It says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. This is found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. This messenger that this prophet is talking about is John the Baptist. He was the forerunner to Jesus, and he prepared the way for Jesus. And eventually Jesus comes, and Jesus becomes the temple. Jesus is the very place where the glory and the presence of God dwells. And so it took 400 years, like I said, this prophecy took a really long time for them to realize and, and fulfill this prophecy. And in our text, we see Jesus being described as the cornerstone, as uh, the living stone, and it's taken from three Old Testament prophecies. It's taken from the book of Isaiah. It's also taken from Psalms. And it was a, a, a prophecy of who the Messiah would be. And so we find that Apostle Peter writes about the fulfillment of Jesus being the new temple. And in fact, the Apostle John says something very similar. He says, the word became flesh and made us dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. You see, this long journey of realizing fully, experiencing God fully came the form and the person of Jesus Christ. The only thing is, Jesus was crucified, he resurrected, and he ascended. And before he ascended, Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem. Wait until the promised spirit comes. And that's exactly what the disciples did. They waited, they met together, and they prayed. And as you all know, during Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples, and the very spirit that was in Jesus was now upon the believers. And so, the believers, the church, become the living temple of God. You see this history of what God is doing, revealing himself first and foremost through a pillar of cloud and fire, then through a tabernacle, the temple, through Jesus, and then ultimately through us. And let's look at uh, John chapter 14, verse 17. It says, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. What this means is that Jesus, just as the Holy Spirit and God himself is Jesus, Jesus is God, the same Holy Spirit is in us, the believers. It's this amazing truth that we are the carriers, that we actually carry the very presence and glory of God as believers. It says in our scripture for today, in verse 5, it says, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so not only is Jesus the living stone, we are the living stones. We are just like Jesus. We are living stones that are being built up into a spiritual house. This is the dream church makeover that God had in mind, even from the beginning, that God had created us to be his dwelling place. And so we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. You have to catch this amazing truth. We are the chosen people. We are the chosen people. It's not about one ethnic group. It's not about you know, the nationality you were born into. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, we are the chosen nation. We are the spiritual race. You do know that, you know, race is actually a human and social construct. There is no genetic identifier in our uh, genetic code. The, you know, in 2003, there was uh, a genome, human genome project that was conducted, and they found out that over 99.9% .9 of everyone's DNA is similar. It's very similar. And so they found out that through DNA, by looking at someone's DNA, you cannot identify someone's race. It's not there. It doesn't exist. 
And so race is something that human beings created through different uh, experiences and through uh, just our, our experience, live experience, and through geographic areas and when locations and where we live. But according to God, those who are in Jesus Christ, we are the chosen people. And this, just this amazing fact should just blow your mind. And not only are we a chosen people, we are God's special possession. What does that mean? Possession kind of denotes ownership, right? Sometimes when you have an item, it's not really, you know, worth very much. But when it's owned by someone famous or well-known, uh, then it, be it becomes very valuable, right? Uh, there is this, this book uh, by Martin Luther King Jr. It's called uh, Stride Toward Freedom. And he wrote this very short inscription on it to A. Phillips Randolph. And it's this book that he wrote, a very small book. And guess how much it sold for? Anybody have a guess? It sold for $125,000. If you go on Amazon today, do you know how much the same paperback goes for? Less than $10. So why, why was it sold for over for $125,000? Because it was possessed by Martin Luther King Jr. at one point. Because he owned this book at one point. That gave it value. Now, the jersey that Michael Jordan wore in the playoff, game one against, let's see, I believe it was game one against uh, the Utah Jazz in 1998, the jersey that he wore, and he scored 33 points. Do you know how much that jersey sold for during, in an auction? Any guesses? Much higher. It, much higher. It sold for over $10 million. <laughs> and the funny thing is that they went on to lose this game. <laughs> They lost this game. They won the series and ultimately became uh, champions uh, for 1998. But he lost this game. But the fact that Michael Jordan wore this jersey during this game made it what? Valuable. It was because it was possessed and it was owned and it was worn by Michael Jordan. And so I want you to catch what God is saying. God's saying we are his special possession. We are owned by God. That makes us priceless. And I know that some of you might be struggling with self-esteem or self-value, and I want you to understand and see yourself in the eyes of God and how valuable, how precious, how priceless you are. God bought you at a, uh, at a price that no one can pay through the blood and life of Jesus Christ. And so understand that you are valuable, and because God possesses us, we, we have this special value. And so if we have the special value, we are to be living stones, and we are the actual dream house, uh, a church, God's dwelling place that God uh, desires. But how, how does that take place? I want uh, to focus on three things. When you renovate a house or, or any type of edifice, there are three things that needs to happen. Number one, you need a new design, right? And so in God's dream church makeover, the new design is that Jesus is the cornerstone. Jesus has to be the cornerstone. What does that mean? So the cornerstone is the very first stone that is laid down. The cornerstone is what frames the building. The cornerstone is where every other stone comes and, and it's structured after the cornerstone. What does that mean for us believers? It means Jesus has to be the foundation. Jesus has to be at the center of our lives. We have to revolve our lives around Jesus, not Jesus around our lives. Jesus has to be the cornerstone of our lives, of our church, and all that we do. That is the only way it will work to be God's dream church. Jesus must be the cornerstone. And if you seek after your own uh, desires, your own fleshly will, it's not going to work. Only Jesus can be that cornerstone. If you place anything else as that first stone, whether it be your career, whether it be amassing wealth, whether it be prestige or status, or even uh, the well-being of your children, these are all wonderful things, but it cannot be the cornerstone. The cornerstone must be Jesus. And when you have Jesus as the center, that means you are saying, Jesus, I'm going to do things your way. I'm going to design my life, my days, my weeks, against what you have for me. So I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to do it your way. Secondly, 
after you have this new design, you need new materials. You have to go out and get new materials. And the, the old temple, what they used were stones and metals. But what God desires to use in the new dream church are living stones. Instead of the immaterial, he wants to use spiritual. He desires to use you and me, those who are in Christ Jesus, believers. And so what this means is that we must focus on people rather than the building. Instead of building up the edifice, we have to build up people rather than maintaining of buildings. And we see a lot of this focus in the Western church, don't we? We see a lot of emphasis on keeping the building, upkeep of building, and not so much focus on people, how we can reach people, how we can bless people, how we can build them up. And so there has to be this reframing of really focusing on the people. We are the church. We, people, believers, we are the church, not the building. And so it's not the building, it's not the church building that people should be running to if they need hope and encouragement. It's us. The world needs to be running to us rather than the church building. And thirdly, what we need is new contractors, new work, new workers, and a new team. And aside from us being a holy nation, God calls us a royal priesthood. He's, instead of utilizing just one family to minister, he calls all of us who are in Jesus Christ to be his ministers. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, the descendants of Aaron were uh, the only folks that could become priests. So the priesthood was limited to descendants of Aaron. But uh, in the New Testament, Jesus, uh, God tells us, you know, no, no, you, you, us, believers in Jesus Christ, we are the royal priesthood. What that means is we have the responsibility to offer sacrifices. We have the responsibility of bringing worship to God. We have the responsibility of ministry. And what type of sacrifice is God desiring? God doesn't desire animal sacrifices like in the Old Testament. That's done and over with, and Jesus fulfilled that. What Jesus, what God desires are spiritual sacrifices. It says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. We have to offer our bodies as living sacrifice. What does that mean? That means that God is not asking us to dedicate our gifts, our time, our resources, our ideas, our creativity. It's not those things that God is asking for. What God is asking for is that we become the sacrifice. Not that we offer anything that we have, but the very, our very selves become the sacrifice. Oswald Chambers uh, once wrote, he said, we have the idea that we can dedicate our gifts to God. However, you cannot dedicate what is not yours. There is actually only one thing you can dedicate to God, and that is your right to yourself. If you will give God your right to yourself, he will make a holy experiment out of you, and his experiments always succeed. The one true mark of a saint of God is the inner creativity that flows from being totally surrendered to Jesus Christ. When we offer ourselves, when we offer our heart to God, guess what? Everything else that comes along with that, our time, our belongings, our resources, our gifts, they automatically belong to God. And so what God is asking for is our obedience. We offer ourselves in obedience. And when we do that, God can create a living sacrifice out of us, a pleasing aroma, a fragrance that is pleasing unto God. If we are to be a dream church, we have to be distinguished from the temple. Whereas temple life was regulated by rules and laws, in the new church, we must be focused on the grace and mercy of God, of loving extravagantly. I recently read this book called The Tangible Kingdom by uh, Hugh Halter and Matt May. And in this book, they reimagine the church. They reimagine the kingdom of God. And they make this distinction between Jerusalem Christians that were focused on uh, rules, regulations, and head knowledge, uh, and Galilee Christians who were more focused on heart life. 
And he, he describes uh, Jerusalem Christians kind of like the Amish. I don't know if you know too much about the Amish, but they're very traditional in the way they live their lives, and the way they dress. And this author noticed that when he was uh, on a trip, they noticed an Amish family, and they're dressed from head to toe in Amish attire, except for the shoes. He noticed that this family, they're wearing sneakers on top of the Amish garb. And he thought, oh, how odd and how uh, inconsistent that was. And he wondered, as believers, as Christians, if we do the same thing. To the outside world, we can seem discombobulated, inconsistent. And he wondered if that was the message that we were sending the world. And he asked, why did pagan onlookers hold the early church in such high respect, but today's non-Christians view the modern day church with such disdain? I think one of the main culprits has been our paradigm of evangelism. See, in our pursuit of trying to get everyone saved, we've been focusing on verbals over nonverbals. We've been focusing on message over method. We've been focusing on proclamation over posture. What I'm saying is we are focusing so much on just the message of saying, believe in Jesus, believe in Jesus without showing, revealing the true love of Jesus Christ. We assume that we can get the point across and if we get the point across, our job is done, but that's not the case. God's dream church is one where we display the true presence of Jesus Christ. And so what we must do is we must focus on the method rather than the message. We must focus on the nonverbals rather than the verbals. We have to focus on not the proclamation, but our posture. Our posture must be one of love. We can't judge, we can't condemn, we can't force someone into faith and holiness. That can only be offered freely and willingly. And so we have to first and foremost live our lives in such a manner that those that we want to give this amazing gift of Jesus Christ to will want to receive that gift. And so imagine that you purchase this amazing gift for your loved one. And yet if your loved one refuses to receive that, what good is it? It's no good. And so we must approach the gospel in the same way. We have this amazing gift. The gift is life-giving but we must posture it and give it in a way so that the giver or the recipient will want to receive that. And that means we have to be clothed in the spirit. We have to be clothed with grace and mercy. We have to do so in a way that will want the recipient to receive that gift. And so church, we are God's dream church. We hold the very spirit of God in our hearts. And so God is calling us to live our lives in accordance to his word, to be the church, to be representatives uh, into, in this world, to shine that light and love of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Loving God, we come before you and we thank you for this great, amazing privilege of calling us to be a holy nation. God, we thank you that we are your prized possession, God, and we hold so much value because we are possessed by God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And not only that, God, you have created us, created us to be living stones, that we are being built up into a spiritual house. God, what great honor, what great privilege, and yet we live our lives not understanding the value that we hold. Help us, God to understand this great privilege, to live our lives in such a manner where it is pleasing unto you, where it really represents Jesus to this world that is in so much pain and so much darkness that the light of Christ would shine upon this world through us, cause us to be the dream church. Light that, that fire. Once again, if we have lost our passion for you, we pray that you would reignite our passion for you. Help us to remember our first love. Just fill us with a new passion for you. Help us to understand just the enthusiasm and the joy of walking with you and experiencing an adventure like no other, knowing that our inheritance is secure and safe. And help us to share and, and, and offer that same gift to everyone we meet. We pray this in the awesome and powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.